All right, well, my name's Mark, and this is my talk on the merits of TDD, or test-driven development. Um, so this was a record talk that was requested on our GitHub. Uh, thanks, whoever did that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to see more people request talks. You know, if you're interested in something or you just want to learn about something more, please request. We have so many people here. Surely someone else can help you out, and we have more talks like this. Uh, so this is actually part one of the two talk series. Uh, the first one is actually just talking about my personal experience with te test-driven development. So I want to talk about the benefits and the merits that I got out of working with it. And the second talk is actually going to focus on the actual workflows and the way you can use it with different applications to get the best out of working with it. Um, so we actually have a lot of people here who I'm not very familiar with, but a lot more than normal. Um, who here actually actively tests their code? Can we just have a show of hand? More than half. That's good. Who here actually works in a test test first environment? So using one of the test first methodologies. A lot less people. All right. Who here thinks that their tests aren't very effective at testing their code, or that they don't think that they're getting the most out of them? Like they just don't like writing them. Everyone seems happy with their tests. All right. Well, basically, what I'm going to try and do here is convince you that test-driven development is the better way to go about writing a test. It's normally best to actually write the test first and instead of last with your system. All right, so a little bit about myself. I recently started a company called Bullion Capital, a very gold, a precious metal exchange company. I've been brought in to help revamp the system that they have. So introduce things like test-driven development, build up the stack for them, basically just make things run a lot smoother for the company, just because I'm having a little bit of difficulties. But before we start, a nice joke. Feel free to laugh out loud. All right, going to come snacks. Okay, so test-driven development, it's a methodology on how you work. So it's not really something that tells you you need to write your code like this, or you need to structure your code like this. What it is, it's saying the way you need to work and to lay out the actual project needs to be within this process. But so to really look at that, we need to actually talk about what is worth doing effectively. So what is a good methodology, or how can you just work effectively? So just Google it, and these are the basic generic points that you'll come up with. And this is across any task. It's not just software development. But you'll always need a good to-do list. You'll always need to measure the results of things, not time. Time can change. It's completely relative to the project. Your time frames can be extended. They can be cut. The project may not even go through. But the actual results that you deliver, you can't change those. Once your project goes live or you've delivered a product, that quality, that standard, it stays that way. You can't ever go back and say, oh, sorry, we just ignore that that bug ever existed or that this doesn't work. It's something that's permanent until you actually patch it and fix it. It just ruins your reputation. Another thing is build habits to help you start working. So your workflow should encourage people to actually get down and start working immediately to eliminate that dead zone where people aren't really too sure how to approach a task or to actually start working on it. And then when you are working on it, you need to actually track where your time is going. Make sure that people are focused on the task that they're working on, that they don't ever really deviate in either way. And lastly, the most important one, I think, especially for software development, is to know when to stop. People love coding, and people love building systems. Because of that, they don't always realize that what they're doing is actually more than the requirement of the system that they're trying to build. So it's always important to just simply know, look, my job is done, I've done what I've asked for, I can actually stop now and move on to the next task. Now, there's also some programming tricks that I needed to talk about just before we get started. Pretty much what we are talking about before with offline first. Your network can break, your device can break, Anything in your application, you have no control over it. Eventually, it will break. You don't know when, you don't know how, you don't know what it will be. Your end user will also do something always stupidly wrong. You have no control over that as well. But we've all always experienced those support requests come through and you're just like, why, how did you even think that was what you meant to do? 
Another thing is behind every application, we hack away at issues. So you'll come across a problem, and you hack and build solutions upon it. These aren't necessarily bad things. We just need to kind of accept that hacks are part of application building, and that not always getting the perfect way is the best way. Sometimes it is easier to just simply bring out something that works. Another thing is that programming is best done when we're focused. So programmers hate distractions. They hate having to think about everything. We like working absolutes. I need to get this done now. This needs to work with this done. And the last thing, that sleeping on a problem is sometimes the solution to a problem. We've all had that experience where you've given a task and you just you work on it for a day, you have no clue, you go home, you think about it, you come back in the morning, and the solution it's immediately obvious. And all that you actually needed was just that step back from your code. The two in-depth focusing about how to actually implement the solution, but you didn't actually be able to think about it. And my last and favorite programming truth is we don't always understand how our code actually works. Sometimes it just works, sometimes it just doesn't, and it's actually really hard to get that knowledge about what our application is actually doing at a lower level. So TDD, what it does is incorporates these workflow best practices with these programming truths to actually find a methodology that just works for program development. It tries to build in how can we work effectively knowing that things are going to break. How are we going to work effectively knowing that people are going to use our application wrong? Or that do programmers need to be able to focus on tasks? So most people who are unfamiliar with test-driven development, this is how your typical workflow will look like. So simply, you start by writing a series of tests. You run those tests. They will all fail. You have absolutely no code, just tests. And then you write your code against those tests, and you keep writing them so that the tests pass. And the goal is to go through and get every single test passing, and then simply clean up the code, and that is your feature. And then you simply, to add on a new feature, you write more tests. Those tests will fail, and you go through and you write code to cause those tests to pass. You may break other tests with this new code, but you keep repeating that process again until all code is passing the test. Simply clean it up, repeat the cycle. This is really different from normal software development that people are used to, where you plan a feature, implement the feature, and then test it afterwards. And I think that this brings about, about a lot of negative views of testing. Because normally when people write tests, they're simply writing code to prove that the code they've already written works. So it's kind of a bit of a confidence hit, where I know that my code works because the application seems to be working fine, I'm just writing tests now to prove that I actually did it properly. And that, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. But the interesting thing about test-driven development is that the tests become the specification for the task. So before when I said you, you design a task or you design something which you've got to implement and then you're actually implementing, normally when you design it, you know, you keep a checklist of things that you want to do, of ideas of how this is meant to interact with other systems. And it's all done mentally or it's all written down in some sort of system but it's not actually bundled with the code. In test-driven development, your test becomes the specification of the task. It becomes the criteria of what the task is. This task is not completed until all the tests are finished. So what this allows you to do is actually keep the specification really bundled with the actual code base. All right, so when I'm working as an individual, on a project. I kind of feel like my goals are automate absolutely everything. I don't want to have to do any work myself. I want to be dry. I never actually want to repeat what I do. I just want to be able to do everything once. And lastly, I don't want to do any work whatsoever. My perfect day would be me just arriving, everything just working fine, I leave, I get the paycheck, it's all good. Now, so what I need to do is actually get this workflow to, put, to match these goals for myself. So part of this, the beginning, we're talking about when we get a task and we design everything and then we actually implement it, that's not automated. I'm now then checking that what I'm doing against some sort of design documents, against some sort of written 
documentation or even mental notes, and I need to rely on myself that I'm actually implementing this task properly. With test-driven development, the actual specification is code, so it can be tested automatically. I can be making sure that my task is passing the specification automatically, or someone else can do it for me. There's no mental requirement. It takes away that burden off me. So, as an individual, how does TDD help me? Well, firstly, it helps me break down the issue. So, when I get given a task, sometimes you get what's called code constipation, where basically, you have the task, it's just too big, you just don't know how to get it out. And people often find that they get mental blocks at this stage, and it kind of stops the actual development process of people trying to work out how to get this component to fit into the thing. So people often break it down into components, into smaller parts. Test-driven development it says break that down even further. Break it down into user tests or integration tests and actually talk about how people are going to interact, with, um, how this will interact with the system at just a very basic level. If I have a component and it needs to communicate with this component, how, how can it do it and how can we test that just that one tiny piece of communication is working properly? And what you find is that Everything in the application is just a series of links, of things communicating with each other. And if you test that every single link in that chain is working properly, the entire chain works properly. And it's a lot easier thinking about an issue in these tiny little links than simply going, how do I do this feature? The best thing about this as well is when you are writing down these tests, it actually forces the developer to document their understanding of the issue. So sometimes a, someone will be explained to a developer, they don't always quite understand it. They simply just say, yes, so I, I get what they do. And you always get those cases where they've gone off and implemented something that's just a little bit wrong. With unit tests, it actually says, hey, document this, and then you can get, get those peer reviewed before they actually start working on the feature. So you get this step very immediately early on in the development process where you can actually get an overview of the entire feature, get that part peer reviewed before you actually put in the time and actually develop anything. Once you then have those tests written, your goal is to get each of those tests passing. So you start with the first test, or whatever you think the easiest test is, and you just focus on that one test. Your goal is just that. Just get that one test working fine. It doesn't really matter how you do it, as long as you get that, and then you can move on to the next one. And you find that your workload becomes very goal orientated. That these are my goals for today. This test, this test, this test. And they're laid out for me. I don't have to work out what my goals for today are myself or plan them. They're already planned for me. And so I can just simply focus. And like I said before, that's how developers work best. The other best thing about the tests is that they reveal missing functionality or issues that I'm going to have. If I'm writing my tests and I realize that something needs to communicate, I can find that out within the first 20% of time working on this development issue instead of in the last 80 or the last 20 percent. That gets revealed to me very early. And it also reveals common functionality between different components. So this allows you to abstract out your application very early. Um, it also kind of forces your code to be released in a structured manner. So you, often when you aren't properly planning out your application, People will simply release a feature and then they hot fix that feature. They realize that that feature has a bug or it's missing functionality. And what happens is your feature isn't actually released in a structured manner, it's simply just released <coughs> as a series of iterations. That can actually be really annoying later on in the future when you go to refactor or debug that application, that feature. It finds out that, hey, in which patch did this get broken? Instead of just having the one release where you know that everything's passing, you kind of have this string there. Tests also provide a stopping point. So you can say to someone, look, your job is just to get these tests green. Don't do anything else, just pass the test. So this stops people from building out crazy features and applications that don't actually need. No one is actually requesting that feature or it's not needed for this release. Um, it also provides you data and reporting. I know as a developer, I really hate I'm reporting to my manager about my current progress, or if someone else asks me how I'm going, I say, oh, you know, I'm kind of 
on my way. And is this feature complete? Yes, and then they test it and it's not quite broken yet. What unit testing actually gives me is the confidence of where I am on my code. Someone asks me, hey, where are you? I can say, oh, I'm at 23 out of 30 tests passing. And now you actually get a clear indication of that number of where that task huh? progress is. So code confidence in just myself is really good, especially when it comes into a team level. Because what happens here is now you have specs, these individual specs, that when you group together them, they actually define the system for the team. So, yeah. So the requirements that I said before, they're directly in the code base. This is really good in a team because the burden of knowledge on different systems becomes really hard once you start working in a team environment. Someone will make a feature and you're relying on them to document that feature in say a wiki or you know, even just JS docs inside the code or something like that. And you're relying that their documentation is up to date with the actual code base, which is not always the case. When you're writing unit tests, basically you write the test first and that becomes the specification on how something works. If that feature has been released of all tests passing, that is how it works. That is the documentation that you can refer to and share that knowledge around. It also provides more confidence in my team members that I've found. That when people are writing unit tests, that I'm confident that he's writing code to the same standard that I am. That I know that he's writing tests that is not buggy because I wrote the unit test that he's passing. <coughs> Right. Um, so it helps, it helps me out there just a little bit. Um, it, because we got more confidence in each other, it gives high morale as well. We've all kind of worked in that workplace where you've got that feeling that one person isn't really pulling their weight or doing what you want to do. And just kind of that morale can really absolutely just destroy a team. Test-driven development, just by its practices, really helps you out there. All right, and yeah, just lastly, the uh, automated testing, just because it's automated, you don't have to rely on someone doing it for you within the team. It's not a point of responsibility. It just kind of gives you that assurance that the, the product is always working up to the standard. All right, so let's look at this at a higher level. Why is test-driven development good for a company? So as an individual, it's all about managing my own tasks. As a team, it's all about managing the tasks within with each other and sharing the knowledge around. As a company, often it's about <coughs> money. And basically, how does it help them with money? Um, a lot of people say that test-driven development helps them a lot because it basically saves them on support afterwards and it may take more time to development and support. You know, I'm not really too sure, I'm not running the company, but what I can see as a programmer in the companies that I've worked with that do unit testing what it really helps them do is just build more maintainable applications. You know, we're confident that that legacy code is still working fine. We're, we've got no black spots in our application that no one hasn't touched for the last two years. You know, these tests, they're still being actively tested. Someone's still got the specification there with the, up, with the, doc, still got the documentation. We can go through, someone can pick it up and start working with it or build on top of it. We also get much better reporting on the application. So with the unit tests, it helps a lot with time estimates and saying, look, I've got these more tests to do, these last couple of tests are taking me this long, I can report my time better, the company can report the time better, upper management love it when you can actually give proper time estimates about how long something's going to take. Um, you can also assign tasks better. So when things are broken down into unit tests, the person may not necessarily need to know the entire system to be able to work on it. They simply just need to know that this piece of code just needs to do this, this, and this. Which means it's a lot easier to bring in people from other teams or assign work to other teams on a system that they may have never actually worked on. They just simply know, need to know how to commit the code, run the tests, make sure that it's all passing. Um, another amazing feature that I think a lot of people forget as well is that the documentation can be used by other departments. It's not just for IT especially for things like integration tests that talk about how the application is actually used from a user level or E2E testing. That can actually be used by support staff to come in when a feature is added to the system to see how it works or to point out how a feature is not working. So the documentation actually becomes more than just IT documentation. It becomes support, it becomes management, it becomes sales documentation as well. 
Um, because of the release cycle, it helps you prototype out applications. You get to release them a lot faster, or at least release sections of them as prototypes to test them out. It allows you to then build upon those prototypes. It's very easy just in the nature of the actual life cycle. Of life cycle. And because of that, you get, shorter de you get development feedback a lot quicker. So you don't have to wait until this one person, or this team of people who work on this one giant feature, you can start getting feedback as it's released. Because of the unit tests, you can guarantee that the code being released is actually working properly, and that they can actually test just these individual parts of those features there. So Microsoft and IBM, when they first started doing test-driven development, they decided to do a study to actually work out how much they're saving from it. Basically, the TLDR is that the teams took 20% more time to implement a feature that had something like 40 to 90% less bugs in the actual features that they're releasing. So as I was saying before, it's often best to evaluate you know, a task about the actual quality that you're producing, not necessarily the time. You can budget for an extra 20% time to build an application. It's very hard to budget having 90% more bugs in your code. Um, there's actually a link to this down here that you can't see. I'll put that on the GitHub so people can read it later. All right, so a test-driven development is so good, why isn't everyone doing it? Like, why didn't everyone put up their hands and say, yes, we're doing this? And the truth is, it's because it's hard. It's actually just a really hard methodology to pick up and start going with. The best example that I've seen, or best analogy that I've heard, is that it's like going to the gym. If you are just new going to the gym for the very first time, that first week is going to be killer. That first month, that first two months, you're actually going to be in physical pain and not really enjoy your experience. But if you stick it out for an entire year, you will start to really see the benefits of going to the gym. You'll feel better, you'll be healthier, and you, you'll just be a better person. Test-driven development is very similar. If you stick it out and your entire team is 100% committed to it, you'll probably see the quality of your code go up a lot. You'll see the morale go up a lot. You'll see better communication, within your own team and with different teams around the company there as well. Um, everyone's experience with test-driven development is always a little bit different. It involves lots of people. It's not just one person can just say, okay, we're now doing test-driven development. It needs to be everyone in. And because of that, it's a change of everyone's habits. So everyone's experience is going to be very different. And you may find a lot of negative feedback from people who aren't really on board. So that's another difficulty that you'll have experiencing. Um, and it also requires the company to value quality over time. So like I said before, it's very hard pitching a methodology that says, yes, everything we're going to do is going to be about 20% slower. That can be very hard to pitch, especially to a startup or a company that's expecting you know, features to come out lightning fast. All right, so, so just this isn't really applied to test-driven development, but I just wanted to put this in here as well. But frameworks help you structure your code. Methodologies help you structure your workflow. People are happy to pick up a new framework every year and learn it and restructure their code. But people don't seem as happy to pick up a different workflow, to change their habits to learn out how they can better work as a person. But this is really interesting because you know, companies are putting out new frameworks because they're moving forward. But it's our own habits that are kind of holding us back and refusing to adopt these methodologies. So I'm not trying to scare people here. I'm just saying, if you're against changing the way you work, if you're just thinking, look, this works for me now, I'm happy with it, just think that your habits may actually be affecting you a little bit in your career. People are moving ahead. People are trying out different methodologies. People want to work out what is the best way for people to work. So I'd recommend just try and it may not be test-driven development, but actually look out. Look at all the different um, methodologies that are out there and try and work for one that could be better for you. You be, could be surprised at the results there. So, TDD is cool. How do I start? Well, that starts next week, unfortunately, because I'm not going to have time here to go through the whole documentations. I've got a lot of examples next week that go through um, basically how to do test um, unit tests and um, uh, integration tests with browser and 
Oh, so with Node.js, just generally in the browser and with Angular as well. So if you're interested in how to actually start adding these to your workflow, how to get like a CI environment set up, that's what I'm going to be talking about next week. Awesome. So my name is Mark Law. If you've got any questions, please ask. Um, you, you mentioned that you seem to write the test and then you pump them off to your team to then make the pass. Um, in the past, I've always done it where the person who's coding it writes the test, makes sure it's like a good thing, they don't write the code to do that. Um, do you recommend that sort of workflow, or is it, what sort of challenges do you have making it with my personal team? It really depends on the needs of my team at that time. For example, if I finished off a task early, and I know that I can help out someone and write their unit test, there's no reason why I can't do that. The idea that someone has to do this one thing that's purely assigned to them, I think is a very big anti-pattern in the IT industry. I think we should always think of ourselves as a team, and that your team has a list of tasks, and the team should work together to try and solve them. So you might find that, yes, 90% of the time, someone will write their own unit test and do the code, but that's simply because it was easier for them. If it's easier to do um, code pairing and two people write the test together or someone else helps someone out by writing them ahead, it's really just something that you decide on a week-to-week -week basis and depending on the task as well. So it's just, sorry, just a quick follow-up on that. Um, to make sure other people have written the test, especially the ones that say that they write the same quality of code, do you ever use any sort of code coverage for them or what's the code? I always find just the best way is actually just do peer review of the unit test. Um, like, but not only just peer review within your team, but actually with the people who have requested the feature, or with, um, you know, uh, what's the word for it? Assurance testing. It's often just good to just run through an assurance test with the spec just to make sure that you guys are actually testing for everything that you need to test. Yep. Just a, a question which I think you'll probably want to address next meeting. Well, I'll ask it now just to make sure that we sort of address it next week. And that is, if you've got a large code base that has got no testing or driven development uh, and acted upon it at all, where do you start? Okay, so this is an interesting question. It is something I'm going to cover. I'll talk about this just really briefly at the moment now. Um, it's generally not worth your time to go back and test a large code base with unit tests. What you'd most likely want to do is actually just do some integration testing to make sure that the systems you have communicate properly with each other and that the interactions you have now are currently working. Just treat the current system as a black box and just look at inputs and outputs of that. And then as you go back and sometimes refactor parts of that system, just unit test those individual parts themselves. Because in the end, you don't get paid to write unit tests. Yes, they improve the quality of the app, but your company isn't, that's not on the paycheck. Your company wants to pay for people using your application. And they demand new users, new features, things like that, and they should always be your biggest priority. Yep? Uh, you mentioned that the, you know, the tests kind of lay the foundation for documentation and to support teams. What have you seen in your experience there? Um, for support, support, it's I've been lucky enough to work in companies where the support people also did some coding as well. They came from an IT background. Uh, so they were able to actually look at like unit tests, uh, mostly integration tests um, for like Protractor. They were able to go through and say, look, um, you'll have a test description saying, if this person clicks this button and increases this order to this, they should be able to order this product. They will be able to read that code base. So I was in a very fortunate position but part of the test is actually just writing an English description on them as well. It's not even just code, it's that English description saying, this should be working. So what we often find for support is they will have like a feature request come, or something coming out now, and they just want to know how long will it be until that feature is ready. They can get that information out from the test, we can help the clientele, and things like that as well. Um, do you think it's worth um, doing test-driven development working by yourself on a project? Yes. Yeah. No, I definitely do. Um, think about this way. When you've gone back at applications that you've written a year to two years ago, how did you understand them? Or how well did you look back at them and be like, oh yes, I properly documented Very that. Very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> and how many times when you've gone back to look at those applications, you're like, all I want to do is just add this tiny little feature onto it that I'm not too sure that's going to break this part. Yeah. 
So that's where unit tests are really good. Part of my talk next week is actually going to be talking about how to prototype really quick apps with unit testing. So how to just do those tiny little modules that are only like 200 lines of code, how to produce them really quickly with unit tests. So then when you come back in a year or two, you've got that specification, you've got that information, so you can just start building on top of it again. Uh, this is a bit of a new question. Um, what are you using for the slideshow? I know. I think the last speaker used it as well. Uh, this is called Reveal JS. Um, oh, okay. It's you can actually go to slides.com and there's an online version of it, or you can just download it from GitHub from Reveal JS. I actually use something different here. I use um, Jekyll, if people have used it before. It's a static site generator, and with Reveal JS built in, it allows me to do some really cool stuff. Like, also they don't recognize that. Ah, oh, pressing the wrong button. Um, basically, just allows me to write everything in Markdown. And then it compiles everything together for me. So I don't have to, normally with Reveal JS, you've got to write a HTML file with all the right classes and data attributes and everything. I prefer just to do it this way. Um, I might put it on GitHub if people are interested in it. It's actually quite useful. Sorry, what's it called? Uh, this is called Jekyll. Jekyll. Um, but there's, I'll put it on the GitHub that it combines the two together because it uses a custom plugin to do it. Okay. Cool. Cool. Question back. Um, do you bother with UI tests or front-end tests? Uh, definitely. Yeah. So I definitely think that integration testing, which is, and so integration, you've got unit tests, which just test function that, like, very single things. And this thing says to this thing, um, does this function call, expect, expects this back. But integration testing is when you have like a group of those unit tests and they want to communicate with this system, that those systems actually communicate properly. Now you can actually think of your end user as a system putting inputs into it. This is called E2E -E testing, end to end testing. It's when something goes into your system and it comes back out again. Um, there's some amazing tools up there that like, up there that basically open up Chrome in a browser for you and click around on everywhere where you want to go, and it basically gives you that feedback to do it. There's a lot of good CI services that automate that for you as well. But I definitely think it should be part of your normal testing framework. And you're out of time. Now, <laughs> everyone say thanks.